Hi there. It's been a while since we recorded um, additional videos to this massive open online course, Terrorism and Counterterrorism, Comparing Theory and Practice. And a lot has happened in recent months. We've seen attacks in Europe, we've seen developments in the Middle East, in, uh, in, in Africa, in North Africa. Um, a lot of things that I um, would like to react on, but I let, let us keep us, uh, let's keep it brief um, here. Some recent developments uh, that we have to reflect upon are, for instance, the attacks that took place in Europe, in nearby Belgium, just 200 kilometers from here, in, uh, in the city of Brussels, of course the city of Paris. Um, and that shows that a lot of attention these days is, um, uh, or a group that is making headlines, is the self-proclaimed so-called Islamic State that until a year ago inspired maybe some individuals to stage attacks in, in Europe and elsewhere, but now we've seen that they have managed to organize attacks, direct attacks from Syria and Iraq into Europe and other places. A development that is uh, very worrisome and we also have seen um, also new developments or, and that's the, the rise in the number of casualties. And it's relevant to our MOOC, uh, for instance, in the part on uh, lethality. Um, I uh, give you a number of data and we do see a rise and decline, but now we see a steep rise again and unfortunately no sign that this rise will um, uh, go slow down or that we let alone that we will see a decrease. So a number of worrisome developments that uh, challenge some of the um, uh, findings in literature and some of the statistics that I showed in uh, the MOOC. Other developments. Um, of course there's this big question, how to end the terrorist attacks by IS. Uh, France, for instance, reacted by declaring war on this non-state actor. Interesting development. Will that work? Will a military approach work? Well, probably it is important as uh, an element of this broad approach. You need the stick and the carrot, and the stick might be needed. But what is the chance that we will really end IS with mainly military means? Well, let's have a look at Nigeria, where the government, uh, the government, uh, the military, also police forces, um, uh, really fight IS in, uh, in especially the northern part of the countries. And they've done so with some success. And in Nigeria some people say that they're on the winning side. Well, it's too early to tell and, and it's, it's not very likely that they will completely destroy I, um, Boko Haram, sorry, Boko Haram by military means. Um, and, and the statistics also show that in most cases it's, it's other means that are successful. But it's interesting to see what type of successes are there, but also to look at limitations. So let's be hopeful about Nigeria, but if we look at the literature, um, military means alone probably won't do it. We also need police, policing, uh, intelligence services. That uh, explains most of the ending of terrorism and terrorist organizations. And the other element, according to, uh, for instance, the report by Jones and Libitsky that we describe in the part on counterterrorism, say that negotiations and entering a political process is very important. Well, if we look at uh, that particular approach, uh, it's good to follow what's going on in Colombia and in Cuba, in Havana, where uh, representatives of the Colombian government and representatives of the left-wing terrorist guerrilla organization called FARC are, um, um, have entered negotiations. They have been doing this already for a few years and there's some hopeful signs that they will come to an agreement. So there's hope there and, and I hope very much for uh, all those in, in Colombia and in the surrounding countries, um, uh, in neighboring countries, that that will lead to an uh, a success. So ending terrorism by way of negotiations and political processes. Well, when it comes to um, ending terrorism by way of police and uh, intelligence services, um, I think there are some positive developments. Even in Europe, we've seen attacks, but we've also seen examples of people that have been arrested before they could uh, stage an attack. We've seen uh, plots being discovered in time, and uh, partly by more international cooperation. 
After terrorist incidents, there's of course always a call for more cooperation. A lot of, th of this is already happening. Um, and I'm in general relatively positive about the cooperation between a number of European countries, not all European countries. What we also see after the attacks is a call for sharing more data, more data on you and I, on citizens, uh, this person name record uh, that uh, provides data if you take a plane or a train and there's all these ideas to gather more and more data and we see that very often after a terrorist incident that for instance uh, Hollande, the president of France, calls for sharing more of these data. But the question is whether that would have prevented that attack. It's very doubtful that this particular tool would have prevented that attack. So is it proportional? What about privacy, human rights, etc.? What about the cost? So there are a lot of these critical questions that we have to um, keep asking ourselves and, and, and telling to the, um, to the politicians, like, guys, is this really a good idea? And especially after a terrorist attack, that's sometimes difficult because people want it to stop. They want the authorities to have the tools to deal with that. But are they effective? Are they proportional? What about privacy? These are important questions that we have to continue to ask ourselves. And that brings me to the impact of uh, terrorist attacks. We've seen some positive and some negative examples in Europe. Um, after the attacks in Paris in February uh, last year, Charlie Hebdo in uh, November last year, we've seen an incredible sign of resilience of the French public going to the streets, saying we're not afraid, uh, burning candles, flowers, a, a lot of um, um, unity within the country, also a number of instances, but let's first focus on the unity. Think of the, uh, maybe some of you have seen it, maybe f quite a few have seen it, uh, the, the father with that young kid on French television explaining to the kid, four or five years old, that he should not be afraid of terrorism, that they are united, that they burn candles and that they have flowers. And the kid asks that, but flowers and candles don't really help against bullets. But the father managed to explain that if, if you show resilience, if you're united, then we're stronger than the terrorists. A beautiful example of resilience, great father, lovely kid, a, a good example uh, that we want citizen, uh, that shows that citizens can do something by saying these things and that the media and the internet can provide that message to the rest of the world. In Brussels, however, we saw um, a lot of people going to a, a central place in town, the Beurs, where they also had these candles and flowers and, and people were united in remembering the, the victims. But we also saw extremists coming to that place, right-wing extremists, other extremists, clashes with the police. And that shows that terrorist attacks can and often lead to polarization within society uh, that, that disrupts the, the unity that certain parts of society, Muslim groups, others, uh, uh, are also, let's say, second-order victims of a terrorist attack. Um, let's focus on the positive uh, developments uh, that we've seen, but there are also negative examples. Now, let me finally end something more on a more positive note, uh, a positive announcement. Um, my colleague uh, Janine de Roy van Zuiderwijn and I just finished a book uh, on terrorism, and we couldn't, you know, um, come up with a better title, so we called the book Terrorism. Uh, it's in Dutch, Terrorisme, so a, a little book in Dutch, uh, Amsterdam University Press, Elementaire Deeltjes, and we'll have a, a book launch, an event in the city of The Hague on the 27th of May. Uh, you're very uh, uh, welcome to join uh, this event, 27th of May in The Hague. And for more information, go to the um, website of the institute that we work at, at Leiden University, and that's the Institute of Security and Global Affairs the Institute of Security and Global Affairs of Leiden University. Go to the website or go to the LinkedIn page or the Facebook page of this MOOC. And let me uh, conclude by encouraging all to join the uh, community of the MOOC, uh, either in the discussion forum or through the LinkedIn page or the Facebook um, site. Um, we're happy to see that the MOOC is still growing and uh, we will update a number of these videos in the coming months because unfortunately um, a lot of things are happening that again challenge uh, the way we think about terrorism and, and there we arrive at the core of this course, it's theory uh, and practice and, and we have to adjust theory if we see 
uh, things changing. Not, I'm not sure if we really have to change the theory because of things that's happening, but this is a constantly developing phenomenon that we have to continue to study and we have to um, uh, continuously and, and um, challenge our own assumptions on this phenomenon. So, uh, work in progress and we'll hope to update uh, the MOOC by new videos that reflect uh, the developments that we've seen in the last couple of months. Thank you for your attention.